So Adam Smith, uh, and this is what I, I want to rush quickly through, uh, his life. We don't really know all that much about his life, and it is not as colorful. And Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau. And then, you know, his major uh, contributions, uh, uh, his theory of self-interest and how self-interest is related to common good, his labor theory of value, his idea of distribution of value between labor, capital, and rent, and finally, what is his, the most often cited with his theory of the invisible hand. So here it is, Adam Smith. About his life, he was born in 1723, um, uh, in Scotland, Kirkcaldy, just outside of Edinburgh, which is a beautiful city. If you did not visit it yet, I recommend to you do. Uh, he entered the University of Glasgow, and interestingly, at that time, in the mid-18th century, for reasons which is beyond me, uh, next to Paris, uh, and in a way London, um, Edinburgh was the center uh, of uh, the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, uh, then he also went to Oxford uh, uh, in Bio College, um, uh, and in 1751 he was appointed um, at the University of Glasgow as a professor. Uh, Glasgow I would not recommend as a tourist destination, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, uh, he became a professor of logic, and uh, then he became a professor of moral philosophy, believe it or not, right? The person who is known about self-interest and the invisible hand, his major first job was professor of moral philosophy, of ethics. And in 1759, he published a book, the book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is a book on ethics. Uh, well, we will see this is a big issue, whether this book was written out of uh, expediency uh, he wrote it just because he wanted to justify that he's a professor of moral philosophy and he didn't really believe in it because he was an economist, a rational choice economist, or was he really a moralist? That's one of the big questions. I think what um, uh, scholars on Adam Smith are debating. He traveled in Europe, uh, and this may have been a turning point in his life. He meets Voltaire and Kelsny a major economist of his time and other representatives of French Enlightenment. And French Enlightenment may have actually influenced him and pushed him uh, uh, after the return of Glasgow uh, to and Kilcardy for a while. He went back and that's where he mainly wrote, The Wealth of Nations, right? And that's the most important book. But I think in order to understand uh, Adam Smith, we have to come to terms with with the apparent tension between the theory of moral sentiment and the wealth of nation. Is this the same author, or these are two different authors, right? Is it the same theory, or there are two different theories offered to us? And that's, I think, very complicated. Uh, he passed away in 1970. Well, I wanted to find you some figures about, about pictures about his life. The only thing that I could find, right, uh, this um, a memorial on the site where the house stood in Kilcardy, where he wrote at the Wealth of Nation. So it's not only Yale University which is turning building down, even the British do turn old buildings down, even if they should not have done so, right? It would be so nice to visit the house where the Wealth of Nation uh, was written. But if you go to Kilcardy, well, you can visit that site and to have a look. Okay. So, as I said, Adam Smith seemed to have two faces. Regularly, normally, today, if you take economics classes, right, he is presented as the person who is advocating the self-interested individual and uh, a committed a theorist of the self-regulating markets of the invisible hand, as little government as possible, Pursue just your self-interest, and your self-interest will lead to the common good. So he is uh, the sort of inspiration for neoclassical economics and rational choice theory, right? And methodological individualism, to put it this way. But he has this book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, 
in which he is writing about sympathy as an important motivation for human action. And is this just a concession to his job, or is there something uh, deep in him which also saw the need for a helping hand by the public authorities? That's the big puzzle, you know, we have to struggle with it. Uh, well, there are other people who are more qualified to give you uh, the most authentic interpretation of Smith. I try to do my best, okay? Well, uh, and indeed, you know, the wealth of nation looks like about self-interested individuals and the invisible hand. I will present you enough citations that you see it. I will also show you why it is possible some, some of uh, Smith's interpreters I will suggest that this is the same mill, and in fact the wealth of nation is just an extension of the theory of moral sentiment rather than a contradiction to it. I, this is not the majority view, right? Today among economists in particular, the majority view is that you, know, you should not really pay much attention to the theory of moral sentiment. The wealth of nation gives you the real source and inspiration and this is uh, what guides uh, um, uh, 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 neoclassical economics. But you, you may find some economists who disagree, and you will find a number of uh, political philosophers uh, who will disagree and will say that this is not the real uh, um, Adam Smith who is presented to you by neoclassical e economists. Um, and I don't want to take uh, a position in this uh, uh, I'm not uh, sufficiently um, a Smith scholar to be able to do so, but I will present you the argument both ways, and you can make up your mind, right, where you stand on this. So, the theory of moral sentiments, just very briefly what this is. He does ask the central question, how can we make moral judgment? How can we tell good from evil, uh, good for bad? Well, it's a very important, right, issue and question. Uh, there are many uh, uh, founding uh, theorists of modern social theory were dealing with this. The most important one, we will talk about him at great, at, at, you know, in 15 minutes, uh, is Friedrich Nietzsche, of course, the genealogy of morals. This is the central question. Where does, right, uh, uh, our conception of good and evil come from. But Adam Smith already here asked this question. And he said, well, what the solution? That inside you, there is an inner person. You are two people, right? You act, and there is somebody inside you who is watching you. And that inside you will tell you, you did something wrong. That was not the right thing to do, right? And I think you should be able to relate to this. I can, you know. There is very often an inner self in myself which tells me that was a mistake I did. That was a foolish thing I did. I should not have done so. I know people who have a very small, right, impartial internal spectator. I know people who have very great difficulties telling ever that I made a mistake, right? There are some people who always blame others if things go wrong, right? Well, I think uh, they have a moral problem, I would say. So watch yourself, you know? You may have a moral problem if your inner self never tells you that you were wrong, and you are always likely to blame others, right, if things, if things went wrong. Then you have a problem, ethical problem. At least this is Adam Smith's argument, right? Simple and persuasive. Then he says, this is something which is kind of inspired by Hobbes, right? We are led by passion, but now he is not emphasizing fear, he said, also by sympathy. That's crucial. And that's the crucial notion for those who emphasize that in fact Adam Smith in the verse of nature is the same Adam Smith as in the theory of moral sentiments. Because Adam Smith, those who argue for one Adam Smith rather than two Adam Smiths, right, say that he has a theory of humans which is a sympathetic theory of humans. 
What drives us? Uh, that we have sympathy for others, other people's sympathies, that in interacting with others, we are seeking other people's sympathy, right? We try to please people, right? We want to impress people, right? We want to have a reputation. We want to have good reputation. We want to act honorably, right? So we are seeking sympathy. We have a sympathy. We have an understanding of other people's human conditions. But we are also expecting others to understand us and value us, right? Um, and I think this is a very important and intriguing idea. This uh, I will show, try to show you later on, may not be completely inconsistent by the idea that seeking self-interest is leading to the common good, right? Because indeed, if self-interest implies that I also want right, uh, others to respect and evaluate me, that self-interest also imply that I want to good, do good to others, right? This is in your self-interest that you can say at the end of the day, I am a good person, right? Then, in fact, pursuing this self-interest, right, may not be all that different, right, from the common good, right? Because it is inside you. And that's, I think, uh, uh, the way how he is being read. And he introduces the notion for the first time of the concept invisible hand um, in the uh, theory of moral sentiments. But here the invisible hand is not what you, you, you are told Adam Smith's theory of invisible hand is. It's not the laissez-faire free market. It's the hand of God. Right? God guides us right, to have a proper balance between passion and sympathy. And that is somehow God's will, what we follow. That's, uh, in fact, you know, I will talk about this later on. A big uh, deal is made out of Adam Smith's theory of the invisible hand. The term, the word invisible hand, the term, comes up three times in his work, right? And in each time, he's using it in a different meaning. The way how we understand invisible hand comes from a section once, in one sentence, in the Wealth of Nation. And in fact, it is specifically about foreign trade, right, and international trade. Not among, among, about the role of the government in domestic affairs, but it is about free trade, free international trade. And this is the context in which he's using the invisible hand, as it is being interpreted mostly today by Adam Smith's theories, right? So it's intriguing, isn't it? Watch yourself when you are coining a term, because a term occasionally can stick, and then it will be always attributed to you, even if you use it once, right, in your life, okay? Well, the wealth of nations. Well, these are the kind of table of content. He writes about the division of labor and determination of prices, uh, accumulation of capital. He writes about the evaluation of societies, hunting, grazing, agriculture, and commercial societies. Um, uh, he never used the term capitalism. Modern economy was commercial industrial society for him. Uh, and then he offers a criticism of mercantilism. That's where he offers, right, an argument for free international trade. And that's where he introduces the notion of the invisible hand. And then something is on taxation, what I will not talk about. So uh, self-interest and the common good, right, is one of the big issues we have to uh, discuss when we are faced with Adam Smith. And the arguments are, if you are interacting with each other, do not expect benevolence, right? Do not expect that somebody else will be charitable to you. Um, there is also, say, if you are seeking self-interest, specifically in the citations I have, for instance, choosing your employment, if you choose it rationally, this will be in the common good. And I will try to explain why you seeking self-interest in finding the job which is best for you is also the best for society. 
And then uh, he says, well, the individual are the better judges of their own interest than any statement of lawgiver. As little state as possible. That's where it is coming from. And we will see how he argues the case. So do not expect benevolence. Uh, okay, this is a very frequently cited sentence uh, uh, from Adam Smith. It's not in the text uh, um, uh, I assigned for this course, it said. Well, it is not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the breaker that we expect our dinner from. But the very self-interest, right, of the, of, the, um, uh, of the butcher. I go to the restaurant, right? I do not expect, right, the cook, right, uh, to give, uh, prepare me a good meal uh, because, uh, you know, I need a good meal and, you know, I, you know, I, um, uh, I expect the cook to like me, right? Uh, I want him to cook a good meal because then I will give a tip, right? It is in the self-interest, right, of the waiter to serve me well and serve me good food, right? Otherwise, I will not go back again, and I will not give a tip, right? I will punish, right? It is appealing to the self-interest, right, of the person for whom I expect something, right? And not its benevolence. Well, <clears throat> he said, well, we address ourselves uh, not to the humanity of the people, right? Not to their self-love. But we want people to uh, uh, take advantage of this. This is a, an interesting issue, by the way, even in everyday life, right? There are, I'm, I'm sure in this room, there are people who think about this differently. Uh, just to give you a very personalized example. You know. uh, my wife occasionally tells me, this person is not a good friend of yours because this person only calls you when that person needs you. And this, this does happen. And my answer always is, and I think I'm in this way, deep in my heart, I'm a Smithian. I don't want friends, I don't want anybody who do not see an advantage in interacting with me. I want people, right, who, who actually act out of self-interest, seeking my relationship. It will be a bad relationship if my friends overthink that it costs them to talk to me and they do not benefit from the relationship with me, right? I don't my, want my children, right, just to act out of love and sort of be a pain in the neck for them, right? I want my children, right, uh, to uh, see that having me as a father is beneficial for them, right? That's a good relationship, right? Good relationships are always based on self-interest, right? You don't want to have a lover, right, who does not enjoy being your lover, right? Therefore, you want, right, people uh, acting out of self-interest. Uh, and I think that's what he's getting at here. He said, even the beggar, uh, um, uh, uh, here actually the citation says the beggars are the ones who are dependent only op upon benevolence, but then he qualifies it. He said, That's, even for the beggar is not quite true. Right? The beggar will make some tricks in which, in, in fact, is actually uh, will appeal to your self-interest that you are a charitable person or what. Now, self-interest in um, employment, he said, well, it's a very good example. When you are, he said, when you are choosing an occupation, of course, you want to have a big job, right? You want to be well paid, right? Um, those of you who are in economics major, you know, you may want to have, you know, some nice job, you know, some a brokerage firm in Wall Street, you know, and with a Yale, you know, um, bachelor's degree, you would like to earn $100,000 a year, right? But why would you earn $100,000? Because the employer gets a lot out of these skills, what you get out of Yale, right? And therefore, it will be in the interest of the society that you get the highest possible salary because you make the greatest contribution to the common good. Otherwise, you would not be paid that high, okay? So therefore, you will try to find that occupation in which you get the highest possible reward, but you will get only the highest possible reward because you make the utmost contribution you can with your talent, with your hard work, and with your skills. 
to the common good. Right? This is Adam Smith's argument. It's a, a persuasive argument, actually. Right? Um, uh, uh, well, I can go on with uh, uh, not all that important. Now, this is very important, too. Right? Right? Individuals are the better judge of their own interests than anybody else. Right? And uh, 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 well, this is, I think, a, a, again, extremely important. And I'm sure this classroom is divided 50 50 percent along these views. Right? Uh, he said, well, uh, uh, the individuals uh, in their local situations are simply better uh, judges uh, to what is their interest than any statement or, or, or lawgiver. Right? People should judge for themselves what they want, and it should not be a government which is imposes it on them. Right? Uh, this is, you know, a big debate right now. For instance, about the health care insurance, the health care reform. Should we let it up to people to decide whether they want to have an insurance or not? Uh, should we uh, expect people to be individually responsible for themselves to take charge of their life? Or uh, should it be the government, or should it be a statesman, the lawgiver, the Congress, who takes care of people? And he, he clearly takes a position, no, I think, you know, people are the best judges of their uh, uh, theories. Now the labor theory of value. And let me rush through of it. This is important, right? His point of departure uh, comes from uh, uh, John Locke, as we have seen. And it is leading directly to Karl Marx. Karl Marx radicalizes um, his position, but the point of departure is clearly Adam Smith. And the argument about the labor theory of value, the labor is the measure of all values. And then he said, the whole produce belongs to the labor. And so far, Marx completely agrees with him. Right? And we will see when we will be discussing Marx. Um, uh, but then he departs from it because he asks the question, where does the profit and rent come from? Marx asks this question as well, and he says, exploitation, right? Those who earn profit exploit the workers. But Adam Smith has a different view. He says, well, those who well, lend capital and those who offer land also deserve part of the value. Now let's see how this contradiction can be resolved, how he's dealing with this. How can that all value is created by labor and belongs to the laborer, and nevertheless the capitalist pockets profit and the landowner pockets rent for the land. And here this is really very much uh, John Locke, right? The value of any commodity is, uh, 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 well, belongs to the person uh, you know who uh, possesses it, uh, um, and uh, uh, if you know uh, if if it is not for use or consumption but exchange, then the value of this commodity is equal to the amount of labor which has to be put into this. Labor is therefore, he said, the real measure of the exchangeable value of all commodities, right? Commodities can have a use value, they can be very useful, and they can have very little labor in it, like fresh air. By, though by now we know fresh air needs some, quite a bit of labor too. Right? Um, uh, but uh, the exchange, uh, how we exchange it, will be guided according to Smith by labor. Few people accept today the labor theory of value, Smith or Marx, no matter what. And it belongs to the whole laborer. This is a very interesting argument, right? He said, and this is very, again uh, John Locke, right? The property uh, of every man is his own labor, right? And therefore, every value is created by this labor, and therefore, it has to belong to the person who uh, uh, has uh, this, uh, um, uh, who owns the labor. But he said, uh, this is true for societies before capital is being accumulated and before land is privately owned, right? So this is really an argument for ancient societies without capital accumulation and without private ownership of the land. Uh, in these conditions, if there is no capital accumulation and no private ownership, like land is commonly owned, then the whole produce of labor belongs to the laborer. This is where he, uh, Marx will depart dramatically from Adam Smith. 
So where does the profit and rent come? Well, uh, uh, are capitalists simply exploiting the workers, he said? No. There is a distribution of value between labor, capital, and rent, right? Um, and this is reasonable uh, because uh, um, the capitalist uh, uh, offers capital uh, in order, uh, in fact, advances capital to the laborer, takes risks with this advancement of the capital, supervises the labor process, and therefore it should claim, right, some profit from capital. Otherwise, would be a fool, right, not to um, advance uh, its capital. And the same goes for uh, um, land, actually. Uh, land owners also will have to give the land a site in which production takes place, um, and therefore they really should be able to um, uh, collect some rent on this land. Well, uh, finally, the invisible hand. There are three conceptions of this. Uh, uh, I briefly pointed this out in the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, he said this is really God which gives us a sense of sympathy and creates a balance between passion, uh, desires, and hunger for more, and self-restraint to respect others and earn respects from others. Right? Um, and then, of course, in the wealth of nation, this appears to be the, the free marketplace. And then finally, uh, he uh, had a manuscript, his story of astronomy, and he said the invisible hand is the hand of Jupiter. The hand of Jupiter, um, because people, at, as long as they are ignorant, um, uh, phenomena, lightning for instance, uh, but they don't, cannot explain, attribute to the will of Jupiter. Right? Superstition, the invisible hand is superstition. Okay? So what is fun, right, that Three instances where the notion of invisible hand is used, in each case with different meaning, and in none of the cases exactly the same meaning as we normally understand it. Okay, I think I am now moving over to uh, John Stuart Mill and to uh, uh, utilitarianism. Um, and. Uh, He's a wonderful man um, and makes a lot of uh, well, I'm on the long long file. Okay, so this is all about uh, Utilitarianism and liberty, and uh, uh, the long road from Jeremy Bentham to John Stuart Mill. Uh, um, utilitarianism is a fundamentally important proposition. It uh, uh, informs uh, modern economic theory and it informs political and social theories which are in the kind of rational choice mode of theorizing. And the point uh, of departure um, is uh, Bentham, um, uh, who in many ways is the founding father of utilitarianism, though he never used the term. Um, and he influenced the life of John Stuart Mill in a major way. Uh, Mill father was James Mill, um, uh, quite an intellectual. He wrote a big three volume history of uh, um, uh, they, uh, in, in, in India um, and uh, British involvement in India. He met Bentham in 1808 and he fell in love with the theory of utilitarianism and uh, he asked him to supervise the education of his son, what he did. And sort of uh, uh, poor um, John Stuart Mill grew up under the influence of a very strong father and a very strong teacher. Um, and uh, 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 he invented the term, uh, John Stuart Mill, the term utilitarianism in 1822 at a very young age. Um, then he suffers a nervous breakdown. When you see what uh, uh, utilitarianism is, you will not wonder. I mean, 
uh, if you are really a strict, strict utilitarian, difficult to survive without a nervous breakdown. Uh, all right, so what is Bentham theory, right? Um, he published a book, The Principles of Morals and Legislation, in 1789. And there are some very important claims in this book. Uh, and at first instance, they sound very reasonable, uh, but uh, he may be pushing his luck too far. He said, well, uh, we are created to seek pleasure and to avoid pain, right? We, and therefore, if we can minimize the pain and maximize the pleasure, that's when we achieve the greatest happiness. And um, that's what we, we call the utility, right? Um, so action is right if it is leading to happiness, right? We all want to be happy. Uh, okay. Um, well, um, and this can be actually quantified. The action is right, morally right, if the sum of pleasures minus the sum of pains multiplied by the number of persons affected by action is positive, right? Sounds, you know, reasonable, right? Uh, if more people are happy in society than unhappy, then the society does as well as it can, right? Uh, that's uh, really the argument. Uh, well, there are a couple of citations I don't want to dwell on this too longer, I will put in on uh, the web, and it's not in the text I require from you to read. Um, so, he said, you know, the two big masters are pain and pleasure, somewhat of the kind of similar argument to Hobbes. And he said an action may be said to be conformable with the principle of utility when the tendency is to augment happiness, right? Um, uh, yeah, and that is greater than to diminish it. And what is utility? Utility is that principle which approves or disapproves every action to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question. Right? This is uh, a notion of utility which is not all that far away what economists are using even at this time. Then he comes something that I think nobody would accept now, that simply, he said, well, it's easy therefore to calculate it, right? Uh, and I already pointed this out, you just count the number of people who are happy and who have pain and count the number of people who are uh, uh, happy with it and have pleasure and if more people have pleasure, if the sum total of pleasure exceeds the sum total of pains, then you got the good society. That's uh, utilitarianism a la Bentham. Well, John Stuart Mill, uh, here he is. Uh, 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 he was born in London. Uh, he never attended school. He was a lucky one. Uh, but not necessarily all that lucky because his teacher was Bentham and uh, uh, John Mill, who were tough people, and he had to start learning Latin and Greek when he was three years old. Well, if there are anybody who is uh, an Asian American in the room, uh, Chinese, you may have to start actually <laughs> learn how to read and write in Chinese pretty early, but he did this with Latin and Greek, which uh, to my mind is a bit easier than to <laughs> learn all the characters in Chinese. Anyway, 22, he established a utilitarian society and invents the term utilitarianism. And then he suffers a, a nervous breakdown. I mean, two domineering people in his life. And then he also becomes very um, sort of unhappy, right, with the um, expediency in, uh, emphasis on utilitarianism, right? Instrumentalism, the coldness of the argument, right? Uh, he actually beginning to uh, be becomes interested in poetry. And then he meets uh, Harriet Taylor, uh, a wonderful lady, uh, and a friendship, a very close friendship uh, is formed. Uh, uh, Harriet Taylor was a fantastic uh, uh, intellectual as far as we can judge. Uh, uh, one of the very first radical feminists and had an probably extraordinary impact uh, on the work of uh, John Stuart Mill. If he would have been a real feminist, he probably should have put on his work um, 
uh, Harriet Taylor as a co-author. She probably co-authored uh, this work. I mean, she was married, and it was an interesting triangle which did develop. I mean, uh, in what way, we don't quite know, but they were traveling together, the threefold. Uh, anyway, quite interesting, <laughs> what can I say? Well, uh, 51, Mr. Taylor passes away, and then uh, uh, John Stuart Mill immediately marries Harriet Taylor, but unfortunately, she has a very short life and dies uh, after a short marriage. So his uh, undisturbed happiness, to put it this way, uh, did not last very long. Um, and he died in 73 in Avignon. Now about the work, uh, briefly, uh, we'll be talking about three pieces of work on liberty, uh, utilitarianism. Uh, uh, I will not talk about his role as a member of parliament, where actually he was one of the first advocates for uh, female suffrage, uh, um, which did not fly at that time. And he even lost re-election, probably, because he advocating voting right for women. And then he wrote uh, 69, uh, Subjection of Women, uh, which is, uh, in many ways, is a feminist book, uh, uh, quite a radical feminist book. Uh, um, a feminist book, you know, you can rarely read for, from men, and especially uh, not in 1869. Um, Okay, so what are his major contributions? Uh, he redefines utilitarianism, right? As I said, he felt it too cold. He needed, you know, more sentiments, right? Uh, poetry, Harriet Taylor, you know, gave him a sense, right, of the world which is richer in sentiments. So he is, uh, says, well, there, are, there is higher happiness. Right? There is lower level of happiness, and there are higher level of happiness. Uh, to have a good steak, uh, well, it is pleasurable. But to listen to uh, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven is greater happiness, right? It's a higher level of happiness, right? When you hear the concluding chorale of the Ninth Symphony, right? You are through the roof of pleasure, right? You have a higher level of happiness than eat eating a nice, rare steak, right? That's the higher level of happiness. And he said, and he, nobody argues it more forcefully than him, individual liberty is the ultimate value. And expediency, and you know what he means by expediency, right? That you get there by using the least means and you maximize right, uh, uh, the return. Expediency cannot justify intervention against individual liberty. Very interesting issue. A very accurate, a very up-to-date issue, right? Uh, uh, I just uh, think about 9-11, uh, uh, Right? This is exactly the problem after 9-11, right? How much uh, we can act against individual liberty in the name of expediency, right? How much we are willing to accept the limitations of individual liberty. And, uh, well, we will see, he said, expediency is not to be ignored, but uh, uh, when the chips come down, he said, it is individual liberty. He's a libertarian, right? He is for uh, the sanctity of the liberty of the individual, and he's the ultimate of British individualism, right? And the sacredness of British individualism. And finally, the third major contribution, he said, women's legal situation resembles those of slaves. They are only worse off than slaves are. And he argues that uh, in a very articulate way. And, you know, women should have equal rights in jobs, in public life, uh, the same kind of education, total confrontation with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, uh, but he believes that in marriage they can create a friendship bond with males. Well, Harriet Friedman did not quite agree with this, though she married twice 
Uh, she both times did it, probably reluctantly. She did not believe in the institution of the marriage, though she did marry twice. Okay. Uh, well, let me see whether I can still do this, uh, his uh, stuff on utilitarianism and leave the rest for uh, uh, Thursday. I think I have some three more minutes to go. The main themes in the work utilitarianism is the concept of higher happiness. Right? Human beings have faculties for more elevated, right? Um, uh, appetites than animals have. Uh, then he talks about justice and legality. It's a very complex issue, but uh, he thinks that uh, the law is a more restrictive notion than justice, and he stands for the idea of justice uh, uh, and shows some contradiction between law and justice uh, as such. And then he talks about justice and expediency. Why? Justice cannot be simply explained by expediency. Uh, well, uh, again, something it speaks very much to the issues which is on our mind. Just expediency makes it just that you torture um, an El Quada or a prisoner, uh, um, or a suspected El Quada prisoner to get information out, because this way you save lives. Uh, some people will say yes. This makes it just, others you say, no, it is unjust, right? And therefore expediency, you should not use expediency, right? You, that you get better information out uh, from, from torture. Well, I think I probably leave it here and then we continue with uh, 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 Tuesday. And I, I hope it got you up in speed, right? Um, um, uh, Utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith, and you see how actually um, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism radicalizes one stream of thought, uh, which is in Adam Smith, but Adam Smith is not quite ready to go as far as Benton went, and even not as far as John Stuart Mill went. Okay.